Good morning and welcome to this service of Holy Communion, recorded at St Martin's in the Ross Road for our South Y churches on this, the fifth Sunday in Lent. Today our Gospel reading is John 12, verses 20 to 33, and the hymns we'll be singing our Lord of all hopefulness and praise to the holiest in the height. The order of service is available on our St Martin's website and also uh, by email or through the post from the team office if you would like to get in touch. And do the, during the service you'll be invited to stand or sit or kneel. Please take whatever pos posture you are most comfortable with or are used to. We start our service by singing Lord of All Hopefulness. And welcome to St Martin's for this service of Holy Communion for the fifth Sunday in Lent. We meet in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. We confess to you our selfishness and lack of love. Fill us with your spirit. to you our 
our fear and failure in sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. to you our stubbornness and lack of trust. Fill us with your spirit. forgives all who truly repent. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sit to hear our reading. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. You are the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. 
Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to the, myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We wish to see Jesus. As a missioner, I can't tell you how much easier my life would be if I regularly heard those words. As missionaries, you will know that we've got targets to meet for the number of people that we tell about Jesus. And I know that it would be far more likely that we would meet those targets if people would seek us out and ask to see Jesus. The irony in this passage is that Philip seems somewhat hesitant in passing the message on. He doesn't just go straight to Jesus and ask him to meet with the Greeks. He goes first to Andrew and then they go together to Jesus as though they need each other for moral support. Given that Jesus' disciples were so close to him, I wonder what the reason was for this reticence. I wonder if it was because the men were Greeks and at this point, uh, Jesus' mission seems to be solely focused on the Jewish people. You can imagine the conversation, can't you? I've got a bit of an issue, Andrew. You couldn't just spare a minute, could you? Yeah, mate, what's up? Well, the thing is, there's these Greeks, you see, they've come to Jerusalem on business and they've heard all about the master, the miracles he's doing and stuff. But worse still, they heard about that Samaritan woman that we met at the well. They heard that he spoke to her. They think he's going to see them and speak to them too. What should we do? Well, it's a long shot. He's the Jewish Messiah, really, isn't he? Well, not sure he'll be wanting to spend time with Greeks. But he can only say no, come on, let's go ask him. It's frustrating to me that we don't actually find out whether Jesus sees the Greeks or not. Partly because it challenges my perception of Jesus as opening and welcome, open and welcoming to all. But what we do discover is even bigger than Jesus welcoming a small group of out-of-towners. It's a catalyst to something huge because Jesus recognises the fact that they ask for him as a sign, a sign that his hour has finally come to be glorified. Just prior to our reading, the Pharisees were expressing their outrage and horror at Jesus' growing popularity. Look, the world has gone after him, they complain. You can almost hear the venomous hiss as they say it. And then, as if to prove a point, here they are. Greeks, Gentiles, inhabitants of another culture, a profoundly different culture than the first century Jewish one. The world has indeed gone after him and it will get him killed. Because if Jesus is going to welcome more than a few travellers into his friendship group, if he's going to extend his reach beyond the Jews and draw all people to himself, he must be lifted up so that all can see him. And in being lifted up, he must also die. Perhaps the world going after Jesus was one of the deciding factors in the authorities' decisions to get rid of Jesus because not only did his teaching challenge the religious status quo, he was also threatening the purity of the Jew Jewish religion by attracting foreigners. The Pharisees didn't like it and they were going to make it stop. It's silly, but Jesus' reference here to seeds reminds me of the fairy tale of Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack's mother is so angry, isn't she? She really thinks that the beans he traded for their cow are absolute rubbish, so she throws them out. But seeds, although they appear hard and dead and dry, are full of potential for life and fruitfulness. Burying them, throwing them out, is exactly what makes them grow. And Jack's beanstalk does grow. It grows and grows and grows. And eventually it brings about the restoration of their fortunes. To me, this is a wonderful analogy of what happens with Jesus. The religious authorities think he's rubbish. They think he needs to be dispersed of because in terms of their vision for Jewish life, he has nothing to give. He's hard and dead and dry. And they dispose of him by killing him and burying him. But Jesus, like a seed, is full of the life and potential of God. 
and casting him to the ground only gives life to his mission. Three days later, he rises from the dead and the rest, as they say, is history. Seeds are amazing. Did you know that in, in every seed is every single thing, apart from warmth and moisture, that a seed needs to grow? It's within their DNA. And seeds have multiplication built into them. A perfect example of this is the sunflower seed. One sunflower seed, when grown into a plant, it can produce 2,000 new seeds. And each of those seeds, when they are planted, can likewise produce 2,000 more. It's amazing. But in order for that multiplication to occur, the plant must die and the seeds must be scattered to the ground. This is the history of our church. Jesus is described as its first fruits. His death and resurrection begin a process of death, growth and increase, which will see a movement that began with a band of 12 friends spread throughout the entire world. I really love this reading. I love the audacity of the Greeks coming to see Jesus and I'm fascinated by Jesus's peculiar response. But it is nevertheless perplexing and as with much of the scripture I read, it leaves me with as many questions as answers. Some of which are about the text, but many of which are directed towards my own life and faith in the present. When was the last time I really sought Jesus out? I don't mean went to church or joined an online service. I mean really met with Jesus face to face. And if I needed help with meeting Jesus, who would I ask? Who do I know that seems really, really close to our Lord, who might be able to help guide me into his presence? Do I spend time with people who can help me on my faith journey? The Greeks probably approached Philip with their request to see Jesus because he had a Greek name too. They had something in common with him. Who are the people that we have things in common with? Are they our family, friends, neighbours, colleagues, people who share our hobbies? Would they ask us if they wanted to see Jesus? Do they even know that we're friends with him? And if they did ask us, are we confident enough in our faith that we would be able to take them to him? Looking at the passage from a different perspective, are we really, truly open for the whole world to come to Jesus? Or are there people we'd rather keep at a distance? Do we, like the religious authorities, prefer to keep our faith pure? Do we prefer our churches filled with people like us? Are we horrified by the difficulties that different and perhaps challenging people bring to our community? People who are not like us. We all complain about dwindling church congregations, don't we? We recoil at the statistics which say the church will cease to exist by a certain date, not too far in the distant future, if it continues in its current state of decline. But are we like the religious authorities? Do we want to protect our religion without paying any price? Or worse still by making others pay the price? Church growth and flourishing, just like growth and flourishing in nature, always comes through death. There are, of course, the martyrs of the early church whose devotions they got to whose devotion to God cost them their actual lives, and they inspired countless others. But that's not the kind of death I'm talking about. The death I'm talking about is the death to ourselves the death to our own wants and desires. Because as Jesus says in verse 25, those who love their life will lose it and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I don't think Jesus is saying here that he literally wants us to hate our lives. I think it's hyperbole. I think what he's actually saying is that eternal life for all people comes when we stop being so invested in ourselves and our own comfort and start actually living for others instead. Are we willing to die to ourselves in order that the church and its good news of eternal life can grow? Are we willing to do our part in sharing the good news, living in such a way that people um, see us and ask us to take them to Jesus? Are we willing to welcome the stranger? Are we willing to forego those things that we want from church 
in order to make it more accessible to those outside? Are we willing to take up our cross? The church does not exist for its members. It exists for the purpose of making disciples in all the earth. During the pandemic, we've seen an exponential growth in people's interest in faith, perhaps because the internet has provided an accessibility not widely available in physical church. In essence, the church as we knew it fell to the ground, was buried and brought forth new life. Now again, we're at a point of decision. As churches reopen, can we nurture those growing plants? Even though they might not look like us, even though they might be growing in the wrong places, even though they might be struggling and need a bit of propping up, are we willing to die to ourselves to make space for this growth to flourish? Are we willing to let the whole world come to him? Amen. We stand to affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We sit or kneel for a time of prayer. In our prayers today, the response to the bidding, Your Kingdom Come, is on earth as in heaven. Your Kingdom Come, on earth as in heaven. God of grace and glory, we pray for your church throughout the world, especially today remembering the whole Anglican Communion and our Church of England. In the Porvu Communion, the Diocese of Lund in Sweden, and of Keschel, Ossory and Ferns in Ireland, and the Diocese of Ely. And in the Diocese of Hereford, we pray today for the Kington and Webley Deanery. And here in South Wye, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith particularly those worshipping at Our Ladies, at Hudson Baptist and at Challenge Church. As we give you thanks for your church everywhere, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. As we remember all those who are adversely treated because of racism, anti-Semitism or prejudice, we pray for the time to come when all people will rejoice in the diversity of humanity. Your kingdom come 
on earth as in heaven. As we remember those who are vulnerable, frightened to leave their homes for fear of street crime, we pray for the time to come when violence will be no more and all will live in security and safety. Your kingdom come, on earth as in heaven. As we remember those who have suffered abuse at the hands of friend or stranger and who bear the scars physical, mental and emotional. We pray for the time when all women and all men will respect each other and where children will not fear violence or abuse. Your kingdom come, on earth as in heaven. As we remember those whose human rights are ignored, those used as political pawns in disputes between nations, those who live in constant fear of the bomb or the bullet, as we especially remember the people of Myanmar and Yemen. We pray for the time when your peace will reign throughout the world. Your kingdom come, on earth as in heaven. As we remember those who are alone and isolated, those who mourn, those who are ill and those who looked a look after loved ones. And as we especially pray for healing in the lives of Gaynor, Oliver, Bob, Emma, Doris, Anne, Chrissy, Harry, Marcia, David, Carol, Hannah, Viv, Beris, Victoria, Lee, Joe, Helen, Daphne, Ronnie, Roger, Nick, Barbara, Yvonne, Dot, Brenda, Andrea, Rob, Mel, Marcia, Immy, Marie, and Marion. And trust into your loving care those who have died, including Eileen, William, Jeanette, Ronald, Gordon, Simon, Pamela, Philip, Clifford, Josie, Leslie, Stephen, Rosemary, Edward, Brian, and Edie. We pray for the time when there will be no more pain or tears, and when all will live in full community. Your kingdom come, on earth as in heaven. Loving Lord, as we look upon each other, may we see your image which we all share. May we love as we are loved, and may we welcome as we have been welcomed by you. We offer these prayers in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. God of our journey, as we walk with you on your path of obedience, sustain us on our way and lead us to your glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty Father and Almighty God and Everlasting Father.
through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these forty days you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer and acts of service you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendour of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels for ever praising you and singing. Amen. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Bring us at the last 
with Martin, Peter, Mary and all the saints, to the vision of that eternal splendour for which you have created us, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and glory, honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all peoples. Amen. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.
reminder that the newsletter containing our prayers for the week, notices and other information, including our Bible study, can be found uh, on our website or can be obtained from the office if you'd like one emailed or posted to you, please do get in touch. It includes this week information about a service on Tuesday, which will be on our Facebook page at 11.30am, Prayers for the National Day of Reflection on the uh, Covid pandemic. And next Sunday, our service at 10 o'clock here on Facebook and on YouTube of Holy Communion for Palm Sunday will be followed at St Martin's Church outside the church by a Palm Sunday procession service and if you'd like to come to that you'd be very welcome. Please do dress appropriately for the weather and be aware that we'll be walking on very uneven service, uh, surfaces. That procession around the outside of the church will be live streamed onto our Facebook page so that if you're not able to come, you would be uh, very welcome to join us online. Thank you. <laughs>